It's hard to imagine a more beautiful place to fly low and slow, hugging the terrain. Two big balls right there. This is a place that returns the embrace to those who bring an open heart, a curious mind, and a burning desire to protect what is here. I love what I do. It's a very good job. I love flying. I love looking at the animals. I love the kind of job because it has a meaning. It's a job with a meaning. When we banked sharply over Africa's big, beleaguered animals, it seemed as if I could reach out and touch them. Sure, it's a thrill-a-minute, trunk-top-level sightseeing mission, but there is much more to it than that. Listen to the pilots, George Moangi. I think uh, as long as I can remember. I've always wanted to be a pilot. Isaac Oyeli. It was my dream. Flying was my dream. And uh, I can really tell you that I've come this far because of my own initiative. Moses Lelisit. I joined KWS in 1990, and uh, before I joined KWS, I used to have a dream one day I'll become a pilot. Okay. Okay. For the pattern, when we come in... Um, it's time to get to work. When Patty Wagstaff takes a student under her wing, she means it. That's where she briefs them before every flight, drawing lines in the sand to illustrate her points. There's no formula to it. You don't look at this group of pilots like you would any group of pilots, but maybe more so this group because the, the minimum standards haven't been really high out of necessity. And uh, each one is vastly different in skill and, and experience level than, than the others. So we get an 1800 and check our mags. Some of them have very little experience, just have a basic private pilot's license and they're given an airplane like a Husky or a Super Cub and they're sent out into the bush to patrol a huge area, sometimes thousands of square miles sometimes. They were eager at the ground school as well. And who wouldn't be, given the fact that teachers are aviation royalty? The Kings, John and Martha, have taught more pilots to fly than anyone on the planet. They joined Patty's mission for the first time on this trip. These young men are excited to learn and not just because it's part of their job. Uh, they, they are thirsty for knowledge and so appreciative that people are interested enough in them and the work that they're doing uh, to come clear from uh, USA in order to work with them and try and help them do their job better and do their job more safely. They knew what they needed to do, but they didn't know why they needed to do it. So these po uh, folks for the first time had an understanding of why they were doing what they were doing. The Kings were here in a dual capacity. John is chairman, Martha is secretary of the Charles A. and Anne Morrow Lindbergh Foundation, which helped fund the project this year. It's all part of its mission to promote the use of technology as a means to protect the environment. It's been a, a huge honor for Lindbergh Foundation to be involved in it. And the fact that, you know, such a prestigious organization has an interest in this program and sees it as being so fitting to their mission, I think is, is so exciting for us. Because we've been out here sort of slugging it out year after year, but to have interest from the Lindbergh Foundation in this could really propel us into another level that could sustain the program for a while, hopefully. So. The balancing act is getting harder and harder. Poaching is on the rise in Kenya, and elephants are once again in the crosshairs. While we were in Sava, we visited the elephant orphanage run by the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Intumba. We were lucky enough to be there for the lunch stampede. Those other ones are snares, we have also been recovered. Not far from the orphanage, we saw some of the tools of this brutal, cruel trade. Snares, traps, and arrows that are tipped with poison. They fire the arrow into the elephant, preferably into the spleen. Danny Woodley is the senior warden in the Sava West National Park. How long does it take to take down the elephant? It depends how potent the poison is and how well placed the shot is. The poaching increased dramatically in 2008 when South Africa decided to sell off a stockpile of elephant tusks, a trial exemption to an outright ban on the sale of ivory that began in 1989. And that sent quite a large quantity of, of ivory to um, countries in the Far East. Um, and that is legalized ivory. Ivory now fetches $120 a kilo, and a typical elephant carries about 10 kilos of tusk. 
In this part of the world, $1,200 is a huge incentive for poaching. A lot of the poaching comes out, the most serious poaching comes out of Somalia. Um, it's run by Somali warlords, uh, the same people who are uh, involved with the piracy off the coast of Somalia, for example. Not the good neighborhood situation. And a lot of poaching is motivated by desperation. You've got people that are right on the ragged edge of staying alive. Safari guide, photographer, author, and biologist Mark Ross has lived and worked in Kenya for nearly 30 years. If I had seven or eight kids and I was starving, I'd probably be out there shooting. You're gonna to have to give me some good reasons or an alternative. And then, and then you know, I'd see it differently. Mark is also a pilot who flies his clients to remote safari camps in his Cessna 206. He has a keen appreciation for the Kenya Wildlife Service pilots and their mission. The air patrols are vital. You've got such huge blocks of land that you cannot access any other mechanized way. You can't go by boat, you can't go by vehicle, you can't even go by motorcycle. You know, places like Savo, 10,000 square miles, Serengeti, 14,000 plus. Even the Mara, which is relatively small, is a 2,000 square miles of wildlife area. You, you, the, aviation is vital. It's like putting uh, a police car on an interstate. But everybody gets legal in a hurry. No speeders, no reckless drivers, nothing. They see the blinking lights on a patrol car and they behave themselves. Same thing with, with the bandits, uh, with the poachers. They know there's a patrol plane, they see it flying by, and they say, uh, not this week. When the pilots spot heavily armed poachers, it can get very hairy very quickly. They had laid an ambush. Lucky enough, those guys got into the ambush. A shootout ensued, and actually we lost three rangers, and we, they, we were able to kill the bandits, and one was still firing at our team. Which is why it is so important that these pilots get the best training possible. That's the reason that I'm here. I mean, we have this amazing resource, this global resource that you find very few places in the world that's becoming more and more endangered, elephants and rhino and everything else that we fly over every day here. And um, it belongs to everybody. I do believe that the um, environment and wildlife in this country is, is a resource that belongs to the globe as well as Kenya and I think if we want to keep it then we have to pay for it. It's true, we are on a mission, a serious mission to ensure that we protect this wildlife for the generation of today and those to come. What these pilots are doing is incredibly important, it's not just about being a good pilot, it's about not only saving their lives but you know and saving the airplane and not getting hurt but about keeping the animals here safe. So we want our wildlife and we are happy that they're here. And actually we are going to do everything. That's why I'm taking the risks of you know, being a flyer and just making sure that, uh, I mean, especially as a warden, making sure that you know, we, uh, you know, conservation continues. I mean, I'm going to play my beat. You know, when St. Peter comes or when I eventually leave this world, I want to go to St. Peter and tell him, well, I did my big job and I've taken care of your animals. These are his animals. Yeah, and we are obliged to take care of them. Yeah.